singing tonight. Let's stand together if you would please. Take your Bible, turn with me tonight to chapter number 5 of the book of 1 Corinthians tonight. 1 Corinthians chapter number 5 tonight from the Word of God. And I'm going to go down through a few verses tonight of this book, of this chapter. I've spent several, several days studying this chapter over and over. And there's a lot of great truths that you find in it. And uh, I appreciate uh, God's Word and the truth you can find in God's Word. And so what we're going to do is we're going to look tonight in this chapter, 1 Corinthians chapter 5. And fellas, y'all can turn off the screen in the back as well. 1 Corinthians chapter number 5. And I'm going to read just a few verses tonight. Uh, Then I'm going to preach a little bit out of this chapter. And I just trust tonight the Lord will help us. 
I can tell you before I get started, uh, you're not going to do a lot of shouting. And matter of fact, you seem to be well in not doing that tonight, but you're not going to do a lot of shouting. And, uh, but I do want to say this to you. You need to really listen to the Word of God, what it has to say tonight, because I'm telling you, uh, boy, we are so seeing the day we're living in in this chapter. The Bible says, reported calmly that there is fornication among you, and such fornication as is not so much as named among the Gentiles, that one should have his father's wife. Are ye puffed up and have not rather mourned that ye that have done this deed might be taken away from among you? For I verily as absent in body but present in spirit have judged already as though I were present concerning him that have so done this deed. The name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you're gathered together in my spirit with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, to deliver such a one and a Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the Spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Your glorying is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. Purge out therefore the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump as ye are unleavened. For even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. I write unto you in an epistle not to company with fornicators, yet not altogether with the fornicators of this world, or the covetous extortioners, or with the idolaters, for then much you need to go out of the world. But now I have written unto you not to keep company. If any man that is called a brother be a fornicator or covetous, or a idolater, or railer, or a drunkard, or extortioner, with such a one, know not to eat. For what have I to do to judge them also that are without? Do not you judge them that are within. But them that are without God judgeth, therefore put away from among yourselves that wicked person. Father, I pray may you add your blessing to the reading tonight of the Word of God and use it for your honor and use it tonight for your glory. For we ask it in Christ's name. And all God's people said. Amen. You can be seated tonight. This great chapter of 1 Corinthians deals with a, a, a subject that I believe is needed greatly in our day. This chapter deals with the immorality, but most of all, the immorality in the church. It deals with sin in the house of God. It deals with church discipline. And I believe with all my heart that when you look at this chapter, you can see today why churches are in the shape they're in and why we don't have the power of God like we are to have in the day uh, that you and I are living in. I want you to notice that Paul, once again, is addressing the church at Corinth. Once again, he is addressing them by letter. Once again, Paul mentions to them that he wrote to them before. And you'll see some of the things he says he wrote. You will not find in one of the Pauline epistles, but uh, there were books that were written or letters that were written by Paul that did not get into the canonization of Scripture. You need to understand that some of the words were preserved. Uh, some of those words words were put into the Bible, but not everything and every letter that Paul ever wrote were put into the Word of God. And that's a pretty simple thing. It's a fact uh, that you can find down through history. But what I want to look at tonight is I want to deal with something that's been on my heart for literally two days. I've enjoyed the study of this great chapter. And to be honest with you, I really don't feel like studying it for several days is enough. And I think you really got to look deep into it. And so tonight, I want to deal with sin in the church and the response to it. All right, we live in a day when people just look the other way in the name of tolerance. And I think it's important to address this tonight because in our country, uh, everybody wants to tell all of us that we ought to be tolerant of everybody else. That means our uh, lifestyles that are ungodly. That means people that are ungodly. That means things against the Bible. They 
tell us we ought to be tolerant of all those things. But I think we need preaching like the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul said, it is reported commonly that there is fornication among you. Paul made no bones about it. He didn't hide it. He didn't go around it. He just addressed it head on and he said there is a problem going on in the church and Paul named the problem. I put in my notes that Paul has no problem naming sin. Now when you think about fornication in the Bible, I know many times we think about sex outside of marriage. We think about that relationship. But it's interesting, the word fornication that you find here in chapter number five is actually from the Greek word pornea, which we get our English word pornography. So in other words, this word you find in the word of God covers not just fornication between individual, but also all sins that are sensual in nature and wrong according to the word of God. So Paul's not just saying that there's there's someone doing this or that. But Paul is saying all of these sensual sins in the church need to be dealt with. And so Paul begins to deal with it. Now, 1 Peter says this to us. For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. Now, I want to say this. If we're ever going to have revival. If we're ever going to have a touch of God, it won't be the bar room needs to get right. It won't be the drug house needs to get right. But it'll be God's house that needs to get right. If we're ever going to have revival, we as a Christian people, as a church, need to get right with God. And Paul deals with that here in the Word of God. Now, if you look at verse one, you find out what Paul had heard or someone in leadership had told him. He said there was someone uh, in their church and here's what they were doing. He said they were doing something that was so bad that it was not even so much among the Gentiles. Let me say what he meant by that. Here's what he's saying. This sin going on in the church, the lost world's even shocked by. Even the Gentiles are amazed that this kind of sin is going on in the house of God. Can I say this tonight? And you can get so quiet, you can drop a penny on a hardwood floor and here it's all right, me, I'm gonna say it. I am convinced tonight, I am convinced that a lot of people don't want church, don't want anything to do with church, don't want anything to do with God because they see the lives of people that are saying they're saved and go to church and the way they live outside of the house of God. Do I need to say that again? Can I tell you this tonight? If we knew everything that goes on inside of our Baptist churches, it'd make us throw up. Amen. If we knew everything that's looked at, everything that's talked about, everything that's done, everything's participated in among people that are in your own church. Hey, friend, I don't understand it. I never will understand it. But there is a Holy Ghost living on the inside of me. And when I see it, he convicts me and he deals with my sin. And my desire is to get right with God. Amen. But Paul's addressing this church and he says, are you puffed up in verse number two and have not rather mourned and he that have done this deed might be taken away from among you. Now I'm just going to tell you this. The Bible does not line up with this day of tolerance. Paul didn't line up with it. Jesus doesn't line up with it. The word of God doesn't line up with it. By the help of God, I'm not going to line up with it. Understand we live in a day where everything is to be tolerated. Everybody ought to have their say. Everybody ought to have their spot. Friend, there is man's law, but there is also God's law. And God's law is law. And God's law trumps Trump's law. And I want you to understand that God's law is the word of God. Amen. But what is scary is even in a congregation like this tonight, I wonder what the world sees in church people. How you live. The things you do. 
the people you're around, and the things you participate in. The Bible says they were puffed up. Know what that means? Here we go again. Pride. They were puffed up. They were church that knew what was going on and they were so prideful about it and so puffed up about it. Uh, they wasn't even bothered by it and they were so puffed up and Paul said, it's a shame that you're acting the way you are when all this sin is in the church. Amen. Amen. That's what he said. And the Bible says, for I verily is absent in the body, verse three, but present in spirit have judged already as though I were present concerning them have so done this deed. Here's what Paul said. Paul said, I'm not even there yet, but I'm writing this letter and I'm telling you, you need to get right with God. Paul said, you need to get right with God. Paul sent them a letter. He didn't have emails. He sent through the email and he's getting it to them and he's getting them the word of God and he's saying to them, you need to get right with God. Now I want you to see three things that were going on and I believe they relate so much to our day. And I want you to see them here in the Word of God. First of all, I want you to notice that there is no shame. The Bible says, and ye are puffed up. There is no shame. Jeremiah said it like this, and Jeremiah had very few converts. Jeremiah dealt with people that cared nothing about God. And here's what Jeremiah said. Were they ashamed when they had committed abort, uh, abomination? Nay, they were not at all ashamed, neither could they blush. No shame. And you know, we're living in a day to day, let's be honest. People are not shamed over sin. Even Christians laugh about it. There was a day if a little girl would become with child, she wouldn't be paraded around like this is the greatest thing's ever happened to the family. There was a day if your children were living in sin or you were a drunkard or, or you were a, a drug addict or whatever it was, it wasn't something that was paraded or looked at. Hey, we didn't lift up people like the world does today. Listen, all you gotta do to be popular in America is go against everything God's word says uh, and the world will lift you up. There is no shame. Am I preaching right? I'm preaching the Bible. So I'm preaching right. Amen. People, listen, there's no shame. There's no shame even in the church. Amen. How in the world people can be so out of sorts with God and come into a church and sit there and smile and have no shame over the way they're living? Amen. How do people do that? How in the world have we become such good hypocrites? How in the world have we got to the place that we are so good at coming in and having no shame over the way we're living? Yeah, Can I say this to you tonight and I'm convinced of it? I'm convinced we'll never see revival. We'll never see what we need to see until we are shamed by the things we've done. Yeah, amen. amen. You ever been ashamed of yourself? You ever been ashamed of yourself serving God? You ever been ashamed of the way you live? You ever been ashamed before your children? You ever been ashamed before your others, uh, uh, your siblings or your classmates because uh, of the things you've done in your life? Friend, it ought to shame us when we don't live right before God. Not only do you see they were shamed, but you see Paul says in verse number two as well, there was no mourning. The Bible says, are you puffed up? That's no shame. And it says, and have not rather mourned. Say, preacher, what does he mean by that? He means this. It should break our heart when there is sin in the church. It ought to break our heart. No wonder, friend, God doesn't move. No wonder we don't see the people saved like we ought to. Nobody's even broken over sin being in the church. And I'm not talking about independent Baptist, Southern Baptist, Pentecostal, Methodist, whatever. I'm talking about every born again child of God in the church of Jesus Christ. We ought to be weeping over the sin that is in the church house. People are going to die and go to hell all around us. And we're not even broke up by the way we're living. Your, some of your children, if you're not careful, are going to trip over you and die and go to hell. And you're not even broke up about it. They know how you live. They know the way you live in your house. 
They know where you talk in your house. They know the attitude you have in your house. They know who you are. They watch your life. And friend, if you're not careful and you're not broken by that and you're not shamed by that and don't come to me with every excuse in the world, oh, this and that and somebody let me down, blah, blah, blah. That ain't gonna work before God. Everybody's had trouble. Man's days are few and full of trouble. We all go through things. There is no excuse and we are to get broken over sin. There's no mourning. No big deal. Right? I mean, if someone's brought up before the church like this man who was, ha- who, who was, who was fornicating with his father's wife, which basically means his stepmother. Now, I really don't know. I really don't know if even the father's still alive or not. I don't know. He may not be. But here's the deal. If you'll read your Old Testament, the Bible said that anybody that would do that with the father's wife ought to be stoned to death. Now, I didn't say that. The Word of God does. So don't look at me. Well, look at me, but it's not coming from me. It should break our heart when there's sin in the church. Think about this. Here's a man. Here's a here's a man that is having an, a, a relationship, and I'm trying to uh, judge my words carefully with all his kids in here. A relationship with his father's wife, and the church is puffed up about it, and nobody's bothered. One of the fastest growing churches at one time in Burlington. I won't tell you the name of it, but we had some fellows that worked at the Chevrolet dealership. And um, they worked in a Chevrolet dealership and this pastor's son and family bring their vehicles in there for service. And when their vehicles would come in there for service, they would find marijuana residue. They would find a little bit left of a marijuana cigarette joint, whatever you want to call it. Wasn't unusual to see a beer can somewhere in the car. And these guys were, were working there around other people that were, that were unsaved and that were working around that. This was a pastor, one of the fastest growing churches there. And the world's looking at that. And the world's going, what in the world makes you any different than us? No shame. No shame. I mean, the average church person can go right down the road Set in an R-rated movie with people without clothing, again, children in the room, without clothing on a screen, listen to God's name in vain, and just smile and laugh and never bother. I can't give you scripture, thou shalt not go to a movie theater. And, and, and you know, I guess, you know, cars might be good. I don't know, I like the other one. But I'm going to tell you this, don't you understand this? You sit there and smile and can sit with the world while they're entertained by that and you're a Christian? What does that say to them? Right? This kind of scares me. No mourning. It should break our heart when there's sin in our church, sin in our lives. Amen. Then Paul says there's no discipline. First Corinthians 5, 2, and you puffed up and have not rather mourned that he that have done this deed might be taken away from among you. You know what Paul said? If they've done this and they don't get it right and it's still there, you ought to get them out of the church. Again, this is not my word. It's God's word. New Testament, church preaching, church ministry, administration. You know why they can't do it though? Tolerance. I'll tell you why most preachers will never preach against it. They can't lose the offering. That family's too much of a big wig. And so what we do is we skate around it. We act like we don't hear it. We, we act like it doesn't exist. 
Can I say this to you? Don't even join a church if you're not even going to try to live right. Because when you join a church, you represent that church. You are Calvary Baptist when you go out. That is where you go. In the name of toleration, tolerance. Can I share just a moment or two about tolerance? Listen to this. In the name of tolerance, what we are tolerating is not tolerating us. Let me give you what I mean by that. This world today wants to be tolerated. They want their rights. And I'll be honest with you, they can put me on the front row seat at the NBA All-Star Game, buy me unlimited M&Ms and unlimited popcorn and all the Diet Mountain Dew I want, and I'll tell them they can take it and stick it anywhere they like, but I'll never set in no NBA ball game in North Carolina. Tolerance. Now here's the problem with it. That ungodly world wants us to tolerate them. But they don't want to tolerate us. Is anybody listening to me? The ungodly world says, we want you to tolerate what we're doing. My Lord, the growing, swelling possum churches are growing like crazy because of tolerance. Now, I'm just telling you, I'm just preaching the truth. I know I'm a little old school for this day. But I'm going to tell you something. I've had people to approach me in the ministry since I've been in and tell me if I had to back off this or back off that, church could grow more. Tolerance. Just allow us to live the way we're living. Look the other way. Or at least, or at least, let listen. Let me tell you something, and I'm not trying to be mean here, but this LBGT whatever crowd are some of the meanest people on the face of this earth. And you quote me on the internet, on a CD, and they can come sit and hear me say it. They want tolerance. Allow us to be what we are. Okay? You be what you you can be what you are. But I also am what I am. And I am a blood white born again Christian. I am a Christian. I told the Bible. I serve the same God that I served for you ever got here. And I'll be serving the same God when I'm gone. And I want you to understand, if you want tolerance, honey, I'm in this world too. But what we have done, we have so tolerated people and got them in where 1% is running, is running the country and then they're not going to tolerate us. I'm telling you, the biggest push to get rid of something in this country is Christianity. Right? When you send your kids to Notre Dame, a Catholic school, that is 100% against abortion, that is against homosexuality, and then your kids get up and walk out when one of the probably godliest vice presidents that we've ever had is going to speak because of his stand on the very things that the school you sent your kids to believe in. Where's the tolerance? We tolerate you, but you don't tolerate us. Right? We start hearing words like bigots, homophobes. We start hearing words because we're just not tolerant. Can I say this to you? Love the sinner. I don't care if someone is homosexual, someone is 
drug addict, someone is an alcoholic, someone is a fornicator, adulterer. We still love the sinner. But we do not tolerate the sin. We do not tolerate the sin. It was sin before they started doing it and it'll be sin when they're done. God didn't just write this today. This is not what I started believing today. It's been what I believe since I got born again. Amen. Let me show you tolerance. Again, I've got to word myself very carefully. But there was a day in schools when the thing was abstinence. Well, there was just too many children being born and too much going on, so we started up a campaign of tolerance. What is that campaign of tolerance? Now, we hand out other things, and I'm not going to mention the word, but we hand out other things in the classroom so everybody can be safe. We started tolerating it. Instead of telling our kids that this is what God said, this is what the Bible said, we just throw God out the window, we take the Ten Commandments off the loan, we don't want anything to do with it, and now instead of telling them to be right and holy, we tell them how to get away with it without too many consequences. All in the name of tolerance. Someone told me one time, the way I preached, I was a homophobe. I didn't even know what it meant, so I had to look it up. Can I just tell you this? Understand today that Paul here in this Corinthian church was saying to these people that they could not live like they were living and that something had to change in the church. So here's what he said do. He said, for verily, well, I've read verse three, he's talking to him about what he's, why he feels. He said, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, when you're gathered together, and my spirit with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, verse five, to deliver such a one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh. Now that's an interesting statement. What does it mean? Because you gotta remember, we're talking about somebody that's a member of the church. So when he makes a statement, deliver someone into, unto Satan, that's a member of the church, does he mean take away their salvation? No, because the church didn't give them salvation. What does he mean when he says to give them to the, their flesh or give them to the devil or, or Satan? Uh, what does he mean by that? It's an interesting statement in the Bible. But here's what it simply means. Put them out of the church into the world until they're sick of the way they're living and it breaks them and they come back and they repent for the destruction of the flesh. Well, we're a long way from that. Because I don't care if Brother Barry Halter sitting right here in the front was doing some of the most wicked, vile things he could do and some people knew about it. You knew about it. But if the leadership of the church were to deal with it and put him out the door if he didn't get right with God, there'd be some of you turned so fast on God's men and on the church, it'd blow your mind. You know why? Because you're a tolerator. <laughs> now I understand when people see him, the first thing you do is you try to, you try to get them to repent. See why I didn't preach this this morning. But Paul said, if they're not going to repent and get right, put them out. But now notice what he says. To deliver such a one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, watch this, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. On the Lord Jesus. You know what he meant by that? Simply here's what he's saying. If you put them out of the church and they're shamed by what they did, then just maybe they'll get it right. They'll get what they need to be and they can get back in here and they can get some help. But instead of that, here's what we do. 
Well, they've been coming to church a long time. They're really good folks. And we look the other way. We tolerate sin. You know what our kids think we are when we do that? Hypocrites. That's what they think we are. They get up there and preach this, that, and the other. Then when they get up there and preach living right, and somebody doesn't live right, Back some time ago in this church, we had someone that won quite a bit of money. To be totally honest with you, they were a wonderful family. I enjoyed being their pastor. Good folks. But the news media got a hold of it. And the news media, when he got a hold of it, didn't know it was this church, but ran it in the ground. Because I wouldn't take 50000 or whatever dollars. Ran us in the ground. But let me ask you a question. What if I would have tolerated it? After all them times of preaching against the lottery and preaching against gambling, what if I would have tolerated it and took it? Do you know what the world would have done then? Well, that shows you what they are. Boy, they didn't mind taking it. They said they were against it, but they didn't mind taking it. So I just erred on the high ground. I didn't err, by the way, but on the high ground. Doesn't mean I didn't love people and care about people. But friend, it's about the cause of Christ. It's about the cause of Christ. It is not about. It is not about the individual. As much as I might love Brother Barry, if he'd done those things I said a while ago, as much as I might love him, I would try my best to help him to get it right with God. But if he didn't, I can't look the other way. Am I preaching right or not? You don't like this kind of preaching, you're probably not in the right kind of church. You need to go have somebody tickle your ears and say goo goo. Put a pacifier in your mouth and a diaper on your rear end. Amen. And there are plenty of them. You can find them in rock throwing distance that'll tell you everything you want to hear. You can be tolerated. Now, I want to give you this. I'm glad I got seven minutes to do this and then we'll go celebrate graduation. I want to give you four, I'll tell you what, let's do five reasons why I believe the church is in the shape it's in and why I believe that the power of God is not where it needs to be. And I, when I talk about church, I'm talking about churches as a whole. What, what, how do you get to this place like 1 Corinthians chapter 5? Let me give you some reasons. Number one, constant our frequent involvement in sinful living. When people leave the church building, what kind of lives do they live? How many church members had to get up from a good drunk to get to Sunday school? How many were in a fornicator's bed on the weekend? How many sat and listened to language and filth and smiled as their children were nearby? Constant or frequent involvement in sinful living. Number two, condoning or covering up sinful behavior. I'm amazed. <laughs> I saw a bumper sticker one day that said, love is love. You know, it's probably on a Prius, but <laughs> love is love. It don't matter what you love, just love something. I can see it now. A woman come walking down the aisle and beside of her a golden retriever with a veil. And if I don't do the wedding, be thrown in jail. 
It's not going to stop. It's going to go on and on and on. And even the Word of God warns us of bestiality. It's not going to stop. I know some of y'all dog lovers and you're going to hate me when I get ready to say this, but I'm not kissing a stinking dog in the mouth. Just ain't going to happen with me. I don't love any dog that much. Matter of fact, I ain't love but one woman that much. I kiss my mom on the cheek. I'm telling you, it's coming. Oh, I'm popular now, aren't I? Some of y'all go home, kiss your dog right in the lips. You think it was quiet. <laughs> Number three, now I don't hate dogs. I just don't kiss them. I did a few when I was dating early on, but got past that. <laughs> <laughs> Try to lighten things up a little bit here. Number three, continual exposure to the influence of sin day by day. If you see it long enough, you will eventually do it. The Bible says, said no wicked thing before thine eyes. Know what the Word of God says? Continual exposure to the influence of sin. My wife and I have several TV programs that we enjoy watching. But there are several of them that we've deleted. I don't know whether you've noticed or not, especially NBC, and, 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 and really you have to watch every major network, it is all propaganda. They are pushing a lifestyle. And I'm not just talking about a lifestyle of immorality. They're, they're pushing a lot. Do you realize, do you realize the lifestyles being pushed by media and by by Television and sitcoms. Now you you listen. You don't have to you don't have to like this. You dog whispers don't have to like it. But don't you listen to me? Let me say something to you. The more you laugh at it, look at it, watch it, the more you tolerate it. I know some of y'all think I'm some old fogey, some guy, well, he's been preaching a long time and he just don't know the modern day. Let me tell you something, friend. The more you tolerate, the more you're going to become. That's the truth. Whether you like it or not, you can thank God the election went the way it did. I don't care if you don't like red-headed Donald Trump or any of it. I, it don't matter to me. If it had went the other way, you'd have started tolerating things before long. You never dreamed you'd have to tolerate. It was coming, and it was coming in a storm. That's right. But that's why the world got so mad, busting out windows, burning up cars, rioting on streets and colleges, because they almost had it. They almost had it. There was a day, well, I'll be honest with you. I, I'm not, I would love to just preach this gun bound to say a couple things, but that, with children here, I'm not going to do it. But I'm going to say this to you. There was a time some of the stuff you see on television would have made you throw up. And today, you know what you do? <laughs> She's so cute. They are a good looking couple together even though they're both girls. Don't laugh. Don't laugh. You do it all the time. You do it all the time. Matter of fact, the only, the only weird people in the world are Christians. Right? Am I preaching truth, Brother Justin? But you know what Paul said? Paul says there's enough of it in the church. That's scary. I told my wife for years, why go to a church like this when you hate everything it stands for? 
Oh, brother, I mean you talk about this and you on staff. I will never understand people that go to a church that don't like it. I mean, you sit in the congregation going, here he goes again. What do you want me to preach? The maps? Right? Why would you go to a church and sit down and hear some crazy whatever you want to use word and help yourself like me and you know every week you're doing this stuff and you come and sit and hear it. To me, that ain't real smart. <laughs> Unless in your heart you really know. Yeah, right, right, right. I don't like it. Because see, what you do is you turn it on me. I know. I've been this a long time. You turn it on me. It gets personal. Because the voice saying what you already know is saying it. You know you can't get mad at God in the Bible because if you do, you're in trouble. So you go home and say, I get so sick of that preacher meddling in my life. So what is that preacher doing at that time? Eating some Cheetos, drinking a dime Mountain Dew. Right? 702. A couple of you need to know 702. Can I say this to you? No wonder we've lost the power of God. Right? Number four. Quattro. Preacher, why is the church in shape is in? Constant and frequent involvement in sin. Condoning, coming up sinful behavior. Continual exposure to the influence of sin day by day. Fourthly, coldness in your relationship and walk with God. Amen. You know why so many people aren't right with God? You know why a lot of people are not even, there are people in this auditorium, I could preach on something, I could have God write me a letter about what they're doing eight hours a day and preach on it step by step and they'll still look at you never bothered. You know why? I'm going to tell you why. Because they're cold, seared conscience or they've just never been born again. Right? Amen. Don't panic. I'm not even going to give an invitation. So you don't have to move. Everybody thinks you're perfectly, everything in your life's right with the Lord. Number five. How did church get this way, preacher? The consequences of sin are not realized. Some people are going to reap it in another generation. I'm not going to meddle. I'm not going to reach outside of the Word of God here. I'm just going to stick with what I preached. There have been days I would have a tendency to meddle and get you in a whole lot of trouble. But don't you listen to me. We all sin. We all know that. We all fail God. I wouldn't want my life on the screen before every one of you of the things I've done, said, or got mad or whatever in my life. I wouldn't want you to see all that. Because we all sin. But see, that's, that is a problem, but it's not the problem. The problem is we're all sinners. The problem with it is, is we don't blush about it no more. We're not bothered by it. We act like well, everybody else is doing it. That's what's wrong with our kids. Our kids have got such propaganda that everybody's doing it. What's the big deal? Right? I mean, Christians laugh about miracle, medical marijuana. Oh, yeah, I'd like to give me some of that. I'd feel good too. Well, yeah. But didn't you get saved from doing all that stuff?
You got people in Baptist church that strung out on pills? Consequences. Got families struggling to survive? Children can't wait to get 18 and get out of the house? But we don't realize the consequences of sin. We don't realize what it does and how bad it is. And Paul said, Brother Kerry, get it out. Chris Hazel didn't say get it out. The Bible said, get it out. Right? I'll say this to you tonight. We're going to have our time of fellowship. I want to have a good church. I may say amen to that. But I'd really like to have a godly church. And the only way we can have a godly church is not what the preacher knows and nobody else. It's what we know. And I'm talking about our own lives. And we try to live our life every day to please God. And when we don't please God, we repent and ask God to forgive us. And say, Lord, I don't want to be a shame to the cause of Christ. Amen. Amen. Listen to me. There's generations watching us. And if we keep tolerating it, preacher, if you set Brantley down in front of a television with you and her mama, and you're laughing at things that you know God's 100% against, all you're saying to her is, that's okay. That's okay. Say, oh, I don't know. They're just seven, eight, six, seven, eight, nine years old. You don't think they're, they're taking anything in? They're getting used to the dark. Amen. So I'm glad there's preachers around like the Apostle Paul that would have just named it. Here's what it is. And it needs to get right. Amen. I'm not preaching at you. I'm preaching to us. I love you. But I am telling you something. There is way too much sin in churches. And I'm not just talking about fornication. I'm talking about envy, strife, contention. I'm talking about bitterness, anger, clamor. We don't get that stuff out. We're just sounding brass, tinkling cymbal. There is no breath. Let's stand our feet. You'll be glad to know we got the rest of chapter 5 to go. That was just two verses. Aren't you glad though that we can preach it? Because even though we may not be a part of none of this, and I hope you're not, I think it's important that we're reminded of it. And I can't be any more explicit than I was because I have children in the building. I could say more to you as as men and women, but there's no need of that in the congregation with with little ones. They see enough of this stinking world as it is. But I do want to say this to you. The next verses 3 through 13, I believe, are some of the best warnings in the Bible. And I can't wait to get in it. I was going to cover it this morning and tonight. But the Lord saw fit to spare us this morning. And uh, so we'll get back to it next Sunday night. Folks, listen. Be real. The world's watching. Be real. Your children are watching. Don't live for the preacher. Don't live because I get up here and holler about it. Live for God because it's right to live for God. Amen. Amen. Think about it. A lot of y'all got them grandbabies now. They're watching. Amen. Your little ones are watching. A lot of young couples in this church. A lot of young couples. Your children, what you condone, they assume is okay. Yeah, for what it's worth. Save your dime. You don't have to come to me and explain to me what I meant when I was preaching. I said what I meant. 
You are not going to straighten me out, so go straighten somebody else out. I'm too stubborn and too old. So don't worry about it. But I will tell you this. What I preach tonight is right. Amen. 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 And by the way, Brother Crabtree, I was preaching it 30 years ago. Same thing. Didn't start yesterday. It's just harder to swallow today. 30 years ago, I'd have been shouted out of the building. 30 years down the road, it's like a funeral. Who's changed? God? Father, Lord, we want to live right. God, I'll be the first one to admit there's been many times I've been ashamed of things I've done in my life, things I've said and thought, the way I've lived. Lord, I've done my best to ask you to forgive me. I try to do right. I do my best day by day. Lord, you know my heart. I can't lie to you. Lord, I do my best to try to live right. God, I'll be honest, it's a struggle. My flesh doesn't want to do right. And God, it has to die daily. Amen. Help me die daily. Yes, Lord. Amen. Lord, I pray for these members of Calvary and visitors of Calvary. Lord, one thing I'm really glad of is I'm glad that you forgive sin. Amen. I'm glad if we'll confess our sin, you are faithful and just yes, to forgive us our sin and cleanse us. God, I know sometimes it's hard people forget, but I'm glad you can not only forgive, but you forget. Yes, thank you, Lord. Lord, I thank you for that. Amen. But Lord, don't help us to get puffed up. Right. Don't, help us, don't let us, God, get puffed up and proud, arrogant in the fact of our sin. Help us, Lord, to realize that, God, we hurt the cause of Christ when we don't live right. Lord, for those that are graduating from college and high school, God, they're getting ready to start the next chapter of their life. And Lord, as they start the next chapter of their life, help them, Lord, to make sure point number one is God. Help them to put you first and to live for you. Bless this generation that Brother Kim and I are trying to reach. And Brother Justin and these little ones are trying to reach. That God, we can tell them they don't have to conform to the world. Amen. But they can be transformed. And they can make a difference. And Lord, help us not to be tolerant of that which you're against. Amen. But stand firm on the Word of God. Amen. In Christ's name, Amen.